Happy New Year everyone and welcome to the first video of 2019 from urologyresource.com. This video is going to be about the technology behind extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. This of course is a question that comes up quite frequently in the technology station of the FRCS Urology Viva. So first of all, let's have a think about what the essential components of any lithotripsy system are, regardless of the type of lithotripter. You need a shockwave generator. You need some means of focusing the shockwaves onto the stone. You need a coupling mechanism, that is a way of transmitting the shockwave from the generator into the patient's body. And finally, you need a reliable form of imaging, either fluoroscopy or ultrasound or indeed both, which will allow you to localize the stone for treatment. So now let's look at the types of shockwave generator that there are. The oldest type is the electrohydraulic lithotripter or EHL. This kind of device has a spark source which generates a shockwave that is focused by an ellipsoidal reflector as you can see in the picture. Now the key thing here is the property of an ellipsoidal reflector which has two focal points, the F1 focal point which is where the spark is generated and then the F2 focal point which will be our stone. As the spark is generated uh, a shock wave forms around it and these fan out and are reflected by the ellipsoidal reflector into the second focal point. The key thing here is that the spark source has to be positioned at exactly the F1 focal point. Uh, Malpositioning it even by a few millimeters will substantially reduce the energy at the F2 focal point. Even with very precise alignment, there is slight movement in between the spark discharges. So the spark to spark energy variation is greater than with more modern types of lithotripsy. However, the energy generated can be quite high and the focal zone at the stone can be a bit wider than with more modern lithotripters. One of the other disadvantages of the EHL device is that the spark plugs have a limited lifespan and may need to be replaced continuously. The second type of shockwave generator is an electromagnetic device. The electromagnetic device relies on the physical principle of when current flows into a metal coil, it induces a magnetic field. If a metallic membrane is placed in close proximity to the coil, when the coil is excited by a short electrical pulse, the plate experiences a repulsive magnetic force, and this is used to generate an acoustic shockwave. If the metal plate is flat, the membrane is flat, then the resulting acoustic wave is a planar wave and that can be focused by means of an acoustic lens, which you can see here in the first diagram. The second type of electromagnetic device is when the coil is in the shape of a tube and the membrane surrounding it is cylindrical, thus the whole cylinder is uh, repulsed by the magnetic field and this generates a resulting cylindrical wave. This can be focused by a parabolic reflector which you can see in this diagram. In both cases the mechanism of focusing is very reproducible and the variation between individual pulses is minimal. In fact it can be measured at being less than 10%. Therefore, the shockwave energy produced by an electromagnetic lithotripter is much more consistent than with the EHL device. As there are no spark plugs to replace, the service life of the lithotripter is a lot longer. The third type of shockwave generator is what we call a piezoelectric lithotripter. The piezoelectric lithotripsa, or PEL, uses the piezoelectric principle, i.e. when special piezoceramic elements have a current pass through them, they change their shape rapidly. And this change of shape generates an acoustic wave. The 
piezo ceramic elements are placed on the inside of a spherical cap and the acoustic wave focuses at the center of the curvature of the sphere, as you can see in this diagram. The focus is once again highly reproducible and there is very little uh, difference between one pulse to the other. So these are the three types of shockwave generators that we see in lithotripsy machines, EHL, electromagnetic and piezoelectric. So once the shockwave is generated, we have to get that energy into the patient and onto the kidney stone. This relies on some form of reliable coupling mechanism. Uh, there are two main types of coupling mechanism. The earlier lithotriptors, such as the EHL uh, model Dornier HM3, relied on a water bath coupling mechanism. This is theoretically the most efficient type of coupling mechanism as a shockwave is generated and conducted by the water directly to the patient's skin. Um, in principle this should result in transmission of pretty much all the energy from the shockwave into the patient. However, the energy is limited by bubble formation within the uh, water bath and therefore this kind of lithotriptor had a continuous degassing mechanism installed to try and remove air bubbles as they're generated. Most modern lithotriptors, however, don't use water baths. They are what we call dry lithotriptors. In this type of setup, there is a treatment head which contains the shockwave generator, usually either an electromagnetic or piezoelectric generator, and this treatment head is filled with water capped by a thin rubber membrane. This membrane is then coupled to the patient's skin using some form of acoustic gel. This, as you can see, is less efficient in terms of coupling than the water bath because the rubber cap adds additional reflecting surfaces and air bubbles within the acoustic gel can again reduce the energy transmission. We've talked about the imaging modality very briefly. Most modern lithotriptors have both fluoroscopy and ultrasound to enable the localization of even radiolucent stones. So those are the components of the lithotriptor. Let's think about the actual shockwave. Here you can see a shockwave illustrated. This is the pressure on the y-axis plotted against time in microseconds, which is obviously a really, really small period of time on the x-axis. This is the pressure measured at the focal point of the lithotriptor, i.e. the stone. So the important characteristics that you can see here are that there is a very rapid initial positive pressure increase, which usually gets up to about 40 megapascals. Remember, one megapascal is about 10 times atmospheric pressure, so we really are talking about very high pressures here. This first positive pressure part of the wave is in fact the actual shock, which lasts for only a few nanoseconds before the pressure gradually drops to zero. However, it doesn't stop there. There is usually then a region of negative pressure that lasts a bit longer, around three microseconds. The peak negative pressure is usually in the region of around minus 10 megapascals. The amplitude of the negative pressure is always much less than the peak positive pressure. Now it's important to bear in mind that the waveform has both the initial uh, high pressure shock wave as well as the following uh, bit of negative pressure because damage to the stone can occur during both phases of the wave. During the shock phase, i.e. the positive pressure phase, you get the direct compressive and tensile effects of the shockwave which squeezes and pulls a stone apart. The shockwave can of course be internally reflected by the stone doing more damage. However, during the negative pressure phase, the fluid surrounding the stone, i.e. the urine, develops these so-called cavitation bubbles due to negative pressure. As the pressure then equalizes back to zero, the cavitation bubbles suddenly collapse and this sends out so-called micro jets from the surrounding fluid 
and these can then impact on the stone and cause further damage. So I think that's all I've got to say in this video about ESWL technology. I think the key points are knowing what the components of a lithotripter are, being able to describe the types of shockwave generation and focusing mechanism that relate to each type. I think you need to know a little bit about good coupling and you certainly need to be able to draw and describe a shockwave. For now, thanks for watching the video and if you liked it, please subscribe to my channel. Watch out for lots more videos throughout 2019. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.